Welcome to Talking Justice 2016, presented by Bendigo's Lodham Campaspe Community Legal Centre, which is a program of Arc Justice. I'm Chris Sedgman. I'm the Operations Manager for Arc Justice. We begin today by acknowledging that we gather on the land of the Jar Jar Rung, whose ancestors and their descendants are the traditional owners of this country. We acknowledge that their living culture, unique role in the life of this region, and that they continue to perform age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We also acknowledge their elders past and present and whose members who may be with us today. Now in its third year, Talking Justice provides an opportunity for people in the Victorian region to reflect on the big justice issues, refugee policies, crime and punishment, gender equality and sexual diversity, dispossession, reconciliation and global poverty. Harvard professor um, and moral philosopher Michael Sandel in his book Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? says that to achieve a just society we have to reason together about the meaning of the good life and to create a public culture hospitable to the disagreements that will inevitably rise. So here, right now, we are seeking to build a, hospita a hospitable pub public culture. And so we invite you to engage with this, this afternoon's presenters in that spirit, mindful of the views that you have and are committed to our collective wellbeing. Please honour the opportunity to listen to the speakers, honour the invitation to them and their willingness to come, and honour the limited time that we have together. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Martin Krigia. Martin is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory, Co-Director, Network for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law at the University of New South Wales. As we've said before, he's a deep thinker. Over lunch and other times, a wonderful conversationalist, and we're lucky to be in his hands. Please join me to Mar welcome Martin. Thank you. If I do too many more sessions of this, I'll start to believe it, which would be nice. It would be very nice. Uh, I think our panel needs to come for me to begin our session. This is a session on gender and diversity, shifting frontiers. And we have three distinguished and varied panellists who do exist, but are very shy. Uh, but they're now overcoming their shyness and they'll be in front of you in a moment. I'll introduce each of the panellists just before they speak so that you have fresh in your mind who they are. I'm not a, no a local, uh, so I relied initially on briefing notes which were provided by uh, the, the centre and to learn who we're dealing with. And um, I learnt initially, rather soberly in description, that the Honourable Howard Nathan QC is a former Victorian Supreme Court judge and advisor to federal ministers. I thought that's okay. It may not be very interesting, but, but it's likely to be very authoritative and ex expert. He retired in 97, currently living near Bendigo. He was a member of the Immigration Reform Group that published a paper, Control or Colour Bar, started to get a bit warmer, uh, per a, a judge with a social conscience. It's not a contradiction in terms, it could happen. Uh, and it's clear, then, then the notes have a quotation from somebody that I don't know, but it warmed me up a little more. No one is immune, I was told, from the Howard Nathan humour, sometimes inadvertent, but mostly it is a carefully crafted chutzpah, drawing upon his Jewish roots, his legal wit, and the keenness to be a bit of a stirrer, to shock even. So then I went back to the Victoria Supreme Court judge, advisor to federal ministers. It sounded like an interesting combination of contrasts. And then, with briefing notes, they give a, a number of uh, hyperlinks to texts, and one was from Justinian. Oh. And I, I learnt that... Uh, uh, 
in a, in a tale of an appeal from a, ju a judgment of justice, as I guess he was then, Nathan, uh, on a case between uh, a psychiatric nurse, I think, and a former patient, or a, a liaison between those two, uh, Justinian goes on, in a searing judgment penned by a number of judges, Howard, Justice Howard Nathan is hauled over the coals for his loose thinking on public morality. Apparently, Howie Nathan's moral posture is not only questionable, but tasteless, flippant, and irrelevant. Uh, he said, among other things which outraged the, the Court of Appeal, that the jurisdiction to clomp into the bedrooms of registered nurses and their former patients simply and only because sexual congress have occurred is not within the jurisdiction of the Nurses, nurses Board of Victoria. Uh, what really seemed to rile the codgers, that's a technical term but it was used <laughs> in this article, on the Court of Appeal was the, this pert observation from Howard N about the charge against the, uh, the nurse. It is redolent of morality which penalises adultery. It's not the function of the nurses, nurses Board of Victoria to enforce the Seventh Commandment. Every citizen whether a registered nurse or otherwise, has a basic freedom to fornicate. <laughs> you can see that it's the 21st Amendment to the US Constitution, it's there, but, or it could be there. And then I came to this theatre and I see that there is the Howard J. Nathan Auditorium, and I understand this is a result of an extraordinarily generous gift by Howard Nathan. So it appears we have uh, something with many parts and a whole which is greater than the sum of the parts and now we're going to be hearing from that whole. <laughs> I could apply this as an instrument to uh, the chairman but I'd better not. Uh, brethren and sistren, I'm going to um, defy legal tradition and speak to the subject and within time. <laughs> it is, oh God, this thing is, the minute you pass puberty, you can never work these electronic devices in front of you, <laughs> but I'll try from here on in. Uh, the topic, as you know, is gender equality and diversity and it's changing landsc landscapes. Uh, I'm going to ab abide by a traditional Hebraic injunction which is tzaddik, tzaddik, tigdof. Justice, justice must you pursue. Very often dishonoured uh, by most legal systems in its breaches rather than its observance. But if we look at that obligation to deliver justice, it really comes down to this. Discrimination, which is often different and less favourable treatment of like people or groups causing basic unfairness is the problem which confronts many judicial systems and ours in particular. I'm going to deal with this dilemma by taking you on a world trip. I'm going to gallop you through legal systems and traditions in a very short term and return then to the state of Victoria and possibly even as local as Bendigo. In my view, the basic form of discrimination which gives rise to every other permissible form is discrimination against women by men. It is the foundational source which can then justify discrimination on the basis of race sexual identity, colour, language, xenophobia and all the other forms of prejudicial de discrimination which can beset us. It seems to me that most males and men of the law in particular fail to realise that they devalue themselves if they discriminate against women. And I'm going to give you some personal examples of this arising out of the Supreme Court of Victoria, which should ensure a few defamation writs in which you can all be witnesses. 
It strikes me as extraordinary that otherwise sane, balanced, urbane, cultured, sometimes even Renaissance men have found it possible in their hearts and souls to discriminate against women, their wives, their daughters, the sense of auteur and superiority with which traditional males have invested themselves is not seen by them as being discriminatory in relation to the people they go to bed with, to keep the people they give birth to. And one of our basic reasons why discrimination endures is that men have not come to realise that sexual discrimination on the basis of gender is self-demeaning as well as inherently unfair. That observation gives rise to the question, why is this so? Now, you're going to get a gallop through religious history and the histories of civilization in even smarter form than Martin usually delivers. Let me start with ancient Sumer and the Arcadian myths. Gilgamesh was the paradigm male, broad-shouldered, protecting women behind him, bearded of course, and uh, seen as the repository of strength and vigour with an obligation to slay his enemies. The next civilization with which you might be familiar, if I take you to, is that of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt had a series of gods, but the preeminent god, Amun, and particularly Amun-Ra, the king of gods, the sun god, was the god of lightning, amongst other things. He, god was a male, and he was the god, Amun that is, of law and order. I take you to Greece. The king of the gods was Zeus, sovereign of all things. Again, a male. I take you to Rome. Zeus was replaced by the Roman god Jupiter, whom we know as Jove, a male. <coughs> it was the statue of Jupiter within the temple in Jerusalem, which caused the uh, outbreak of civil disobedience, giving rise to uh, another person called Jesus, also a male. If I leave... <coughs> the Western European sources and canvas China, for example. The philosopher who set their legal system in place, Confucius, about 500 BCE, also a male. If you go to India with the Hindu gods, and there are many of them, Vishnu, who later became Krishna, was the supreme god again, male. In Buddhism, Buddha, who led the way to enlightenment and self-fulfillment, uh, again, male. Within Judaism, which perhaps you should see as the precursor or the source of other religious followings, Christianity and, and Islam, although they would not see it that way, again you notice the male dominance. The paradigm patriarch, of course, was Moses. It's a peculiarity of that language, of Hebrew, that all nouns have a gender. So a table or a chair will be, uh, a table is male, um, and uh, other things uh, have a feminine ending. Where there is no gender, the default position is male. So within Judaism, when it's translated ultimately to English, the neuter, the neutral becomes a male. And that possibly accounts for the uh, translations of the old Hebrew texts giving the eternal or God a male gender. Certainly when 
Christianity emerged, it was malocentric, so that you have my Lord, my Lord bishops, Lord of the universe, master of the universe. They are male-laden terms. Within Islam, again, Allah is male ending and it's a male terms. What is the purpose of this observation? It is to tell you that divinity in most traditions has been captured by males. And if God is a bloke, then women are somewhat less than blokes. And that, in my view, has been the source of the male differentiation and the male superiority vis-a-vis -vis females, which has been common to many, or pr pretty well all of our uh, cultural wellsprings, common to our history, and it has been the nurturing force which has enabled males throughout thousands of years to effectively discriminate against women. In my view, it is morally, culturally, and spiritually wicked to assume that of all God's creatures, if you happen to believe in her, uh, mm -hmm cannot be treated as equals. It's a denial of humanity at its most basic levels. It's to be challenged at every basic level. It is to be challenged not only because it delivers unfairness, but because it is morally indefensible. And I'm glad to say that in the state of Victoria, there have been great challenges to this male centricism by very, very recent governments. What has been common to this male-centric uh, system of belief? Two things. In all those religions I've referred to, and I'll add a third, AFL football, <laughs> there is one thing in common. The males dress themselves in facial hair, whether in fact it's um, depictions of Jesus, who looks like a full forward for Carlton, uh, denying his racial origins, or whether it's Lord Vishnu, or whether it's Confucius or Buddha, they are all seen and portrayed as wearing beards. And this is a symptom, it's a trivial symptom, but it's something that women can't challenge. So males set themselves aside not only intellectually, but in fact by dress. Now, I want to leave the world scene and return to Victoria uh, and, to, and to Australia. We began as a, as you know, a convict colony. We had the extraordinary experience of delivering a system back in the 1800s, which turned felons into yeomen. My convict origins, and I've come from a couple of generations of very good thieves, we were translated into yeomen within five or six years because we were given dignity, position, and prospects for the future. Hopelessness was foregone. And the same thing happened to the convict women. Here in Australia, when the convict women arrived, they had been imprisoned on ships in the various uh, estuaries, ceased to be able to carry children, arrived in Australia after a period of comparative rest, perhaps for the first times in their lives, they had four months in the travel of doing little, their health recovered, they were able to feed themselves out here on relatively new nutritious food and they began to be able to bear children who lived. So the liberation of women from the constraints of a male dominated society actually began here in Australia with the healthful deliberation of women from the drudgery of childbirth almost certainly ending in death or maiming. 
Imagine what that did to the dignity of those women. We began with a mighty plus on our way towards gender equality, often unperceived. And it went on, and it went on. During the gold rush period, even the civil authorities imported women, you might, one might almost say enslaved them, uh, for the purposes of humanising society. So Carolyn Chisholm, although she was in fact delivering women to in a, some form of bondage, was in fact liberating their the spirits a little bit of the males. A second plus. These are things in our background and our history which will and have led us to the position I'm now going to outline. And I'm coming now to the uh, position in Victoria. And I'm going to deliver you an optimistic message. And I'm going to deliver you some uh, observations of the past. Uh, which, uh, looking at this audience, some at least will remember. We had in Australia a de society divided uh, often by accent. You'll recall when uh, accents had to be rounded and the vowels became more rounded, the more posh you became and the more Protestant that you were. And this survival of class differentiation on the basis of speech has only now beginning to be uh, diminished. You will recall your current series of ABC uh, announcers and commentators, most of whom seem to struggle with English as a first language. And uh, they have been able to abandon the rounded vowels. But up until the 1950s, it was a signal of where one stood on the class spectrum. Then in Australia began the liberation both of Catholics from second class citizenry and women from second class citizenry. Let me just give you some examples. When I did my national service before the front row was born, uh, I was in the Navy. And we lined up on a Sunday. This senior chief petty officer would yell out as we prepared for church parade, Catholics and others fall out. Catholic spelled K-A-F-F-L-I-C-K-S. <laughs> and that was Symb symbolic of a division. Catholics and others had to go somewhere else and the Protestant ascendants, who were of course the real manipulators of power, went to other places. That terrible division emphasised by that story uh, began to fall apart as the split in the Labour Party of the mid-50s revealed to the conservative and Protestant forces that they needed the DLP votes, the votes of the Catholic Party, if they were to retain office. By subterfuge and unacknowledged, the liberation of Australian society from some of its worst sexist and religious discriminations began in a completely unintended way by those who up until that time held power. Now in the Liberal Party at the time of the split, there were no Catholics. Phil Lynch became the first Catholic minister uh, in a conservative government. The transition of the very sizable Catholic minority about 25% then, much more now, uh, began by that process. We didn't suffer in Australia the same divisions based on religion, accent and class as occurred in Ireland. The Irish who came here were ultimately able to abandon that 
sense of self-identity. And in doing that, the realization is that they had to be accompanied by their women. And the parties then began to open themselves to women. I know we had Edith Lyons back in the 30s, but then we got the Dorothy Tagneys and others. And so women, not intendingly, began to make their way into the mainstream of political life. And it was much encouraged by the decline of the traditional male-dominated vehicles of authority. I guess most people here come from Bendigo. So you can look at the Freemasons Temple in View Street, the largest, most ornate Greek structure in town. It was the former Masonic Temple, a symbol of position, power, wealth and influence. Where do the Masons now meet? In a warehouse out on the MacIver Road. <laughs> Those traditional vehicles of power, the Chambers of Commerce, but Freemasonry in particular, began to die as wives said, what's wrong with me that I can't join your organisation? A subtle assault on the citadels of power. Let me tell you some of the worst stories rising out of the Supreme Court in my experience. We, get to, we got to have women on the juries. Well, obviously the stars were misaligned and the world was going to come to an end. And so we had to devise a new form of words when the jurors were to select a foreperson. The traditional thing was, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, would you kindly select your foreman or forewoman who will... Sp well, it sounded gynaecological. And I decided that the only thing to do was to refurbish this, man, this salutation and devise the following form, men and women, would you kindly select the person to speak on your behalf? Oh, I thought this is pretty good, you know. So I arrived back on the first trial and it was a civil jury of six. There was one male here, another male there, four females in the middle and the bloke leaned forward and he said, who's it going to be, mate, you or me? It was an indication of the entrenchment of male su sublime uh, dominance. When in the Supreme Court we had a female judge appointed, well, I mean, plainly, this was an assault on all things known to be good and beautiful, uh, the question arose as to what we should be called. Because up until then, it had been the Honourable Mr Justice so-and-so. I suggested, you know, that it just be justice. I was quite sure of my gender and I didn't need to have it reinforced. Uh, this gave rise to one of my brethren on that court actually writing a paper and circulating it to the other judges that to drop the appellation Mr, and certainly you couldn't apply it to women, would be the equivalent of the downfall of Western, the Western world. That has all gone. It's gone, in terms of history, in a trice. And it has gone for the better. Let me tell you, for the astoundingly better. We are now delivering a better form of justice by men and women who are more informed, closer to society as it really is, and that we are, in my view, progressing mightily quickly there is a millennium to go. I'm not suggesting that we stop now, but I am t suggesting to you that we have progressed at enormous rate very quickly. In matters of other um, discriminations, discrimination on the basis of race is now simply no longer acceptable you will even hear the most bigoted people saying, I'm not a racist, but. Well, 15 years ago is, I am a racist and. 
The progress has been significant. We have a long way to go. The discrimination on the basis of sexual identity was such that when I first did my very first murder cases, it was a defence, we used to call it the guardsman offence, guardsman's defence, that uh, the male had made an approach to another male in a bar and that was therefore justification for murder. It was put up quite seriously. Now it would be laughed at. The um, fact that gender diversification is recognised by most of the judiciary now is a light year away from it was when I was first appointed in my lifetime. In my lifetime, uh, gay judges lived a lives of deceit, telling lies from the moment they got out of bed until the moment they, w they rested. When there was some threat by an activist to expose uh, gay judges on the Victorian Supreme Court bench, I walked down the corridor and I thought, I'd better have a word with some of my mates and see what we may be facing here. And ultimately I delivered myself into the chambers of a judge whom I thought I knew. Figuratively, he was standing on the window ledge ready to jump. I had absolutely no idea of his gender identification and he had kept that secret uh, in such a way as every moment of his professional life was a lie. Now to be liberated from that degree of discrimination is the beginning of freedom. Be optimistic. The progression has been stupendous. We can be looking forward to the future. Whip out well, thank you very much, Helen. Oh, okay. There was so much in, in that talk, even a religion I'd never heard of, but I'm from Sydney, <laughs> AFL, but I'll ask Howard later to explain it to me. More seriously, though that was very serious, more seriously, uh, the transformation that Howard reflected on at the end has been historically extraordinary. Once I was writing a piece with a Polish colleague on revolutions and the continuity of law. How long does law stay sticky after revolutions? And he claimed, and we were supposed to be writing this together so we had to argue about it, he claimed that there really had not been any serious, thoroughgoing, social transforming revolution until the Russian Revolution in 1917. And I diffidently said, uh, look, didn't the French Revolution do something? Wasn't it of some importance, make a change? He said, ah, once we learnt from the Bible that we're all equal in the sight of God, the rest was interpretation. That's not a stupid remark, actually, but it's, it needs a bit of explanation, given that several thousand years passed without anything changing, and with all the discriminations and differences not being acknowledged or being repressed, uh, of which Howard talked. But now, at least professedly, publicly, in our, in our language, uh, it's very hard to mount a defence of the sorts of discriminations which were natural for most of his human history. And one index of that, I think, is the appointment of our next speaker, Rowena Allen, as Victoria's first gender and sexuality commissioner. This is not a job with a long pedigree, as far as I understand. Uh, Rowena is... Uh, a long-standing advocate for LGBTI Victorians. Again, that's not a label or a, a, an acronym that would have been familiar to any civilization until about a second ago. Uh, and she's held leadership positions in the community and in government sectors. She's been a member of three Victorian government LGBTI ministerial advisory groups, chaired the Ministerial Advisory Committee on LGBTI Health and Wellbeing between 2007 and 2009. She's been many other things, all exemplifications of the transformation that, that uh, Howard was alluding to, and all things that I'm glad we're going to hear about now. Thank you.
Can I acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal people that are here with us this afternoon? Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. At that time, I like to... Um, I like to pay respects to my own elders, the elders of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, gender diverse and intersex community because, thank you, there wouldn't be a commissioner in Victoria of gender and sexuality without the elders and particularly in Ida Hobbit Week, which is the uh, world recognition of um, homophobia, transphobia and biphobia, there wouldn't be a commissioner in Victoria without the work of the elders that have gone before. Okay, so as Howard said and others, I've been appointed uh, in Victoria first, first of a type. It's quite good because you don't have any shoes to fill and anything you do is clearly within your work plan. <laughs> but um, I was appointed uh, in July and it was a bit of a roller coaster ride if anyone has worked in government before. I don't think the Department of Premier and Cabinet were ready for me, maybe, or maybe the position, I'm not sure. But I did over 20 pieces of media in the first 12 hours. So clearly it says, you know, sexual identity and gender identity are really very prominent right now. Uh, that's about when they sent someone down from HR to see if I needed media training, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> but if you've survived Neil Mitchell and Red Simons, there wasn't really much else <laughs> I could do. Uh, that's a picture of my family. Uh, many people said, well, you know, why, Commissioner, why are you making this so personal? Why are you sharing your own stories and your family life? I think my role as commissioner is really quite different to the red tape commissioner or the chief of police or the disability commissioner even because it is about you know 10% legislation 90% education and I think it's about changing hearts and minds and we know as as queer people when we tell our stories when we know people we get to know people it does do exactly that uh, I did hook up with a um, an introvert so that was a bit of an issue um, <laughs> And uh, when, when the age said, you know, can we come to your house in Violet Town and do a whole, whole piece? Every job in the house got done, you know, all those jobs you never do. And they took one photo on the porch, but... <laughs> and of course the neighbours thought we were selling, but it was... Um, <laughs> it was really quite important. That's a slide, um, it's actually what it is, is an actual definition of the LGBTI acronym. Uh, but it, it's been, as I said, it's been Ida Hobbit week and uh, I've been in all sorts of places and I won't say which local government, but you know, you've got to feel for local government councillors sometimes, don't you, when they get these really long, you know, LGBTI thing. And, you know, the person who wrote this, this lovely councillor speech gave him the whole sandwich, you know, the LGBTIQPAS. And, and they put it four times in his speech, poor thing, you know? Like how? <laughs> anyway, so the L is lesbian, women who are attracted to women. G is obviously gay, uh, men who are attracted to men primarily. Uh, bisexuality, this I think is really unknown a lot. People um, even discriminate within the LGBTI community uh, about bisexuality. And I think we've got a lot to learn from bisexual people. They fall in love with the person and the genitalia is completely irrelevant. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Transgender, if you think about gender on a continuum, male to female is what we understand as gender identity in those stereotypes. We are moving to much more of a continuum around gender. Transgender means moving from one binary to the other, so male to female or female to male, but I would consider myself on the binary of gender as well. Uh, if you want to be really hip, and I know this crowd, you know, you are really hip, so <laughs> we, you move away from the language of transgender and move much more now into trans and gender diverse, okay, and that's more encompassing of, of everything, everybody. And it's particularly young people. Uh, young people are pushing, pushing the language in this space. You know, gender fluid, gender neutral, gender non-binary, gender F, which I won't say. All sorts of things. And the language changes all the time. So I'm really glad they didn't make me the commissioner for LGBTI. So the, then there's the new language around the polar opposite to transgender, which is cisgender, C-I-S gender. So what's cisgender? Anyone know what cisgender is? Hey, there you go. I'll give you a Fredo Frog if I had one. So. <laughs> Cisgender is the polar opposite to transgender. So if you are born, if you're allocated male at birth, you grow up, you think you're a man, you're cisgender. Yeah? So it's the polar opposite to transgender. So you can go home now and say, you know, I'm heterosexual, I'm cisgender, and be really cool, okay? Um, if that's who you are. Um, then, just to remind people that gender is on a continuum and sexuality is a completely different continuum. So a gay man is cisgender. Given the... Um, gender of male at birth, grows up, is very comfortable in his masculinity, but his sexuality is homosexual. Yeah? And the last on the, uh, the slide that isn't there is intersex. 
Intersex people are people born with different chromosome. Uh, and, you know, there are different, depending on who you listen to, there's anywhere over 40 different variations of intersex conditions. It's more common, uh, it's more common than you could imagine. One in 100,000 people are born with an intersex variation. So, you know, these are major issues for parents and families of intersex kids, because what do we say when a child is born? Is it a... Yeah, is it a boy or a girl? So, um, intersex advocates and myself, we say, yes, you need to gender a child. You need to gender a child. What you don't need to do is the invasive, what they call normalising surgery until that young person grows up. So unfortunately we've got many intersex adults uh, where you know, the medical profession and the family have made a decision about gender at birth which doesn't match their gender identity as they grow up. And unfortunately, uh, with that medical intervention, sometimes it's not, you know, it's not reversible. So what we're saying is, yes, gender the child, but you know, if the child grows up and says, no, nah, eh, computer says wrong, you got it wrong, then you can, you know, change the gender without as many, um, many issues for those, for those people, as young people. So it's been mentioned that Victoria is, is sort of moving the way in this space. Why do we need, you know, to answer Neil Mitchell's question, why do we need a commissioner for gender and sexuality? Unfortunately, we're still overrepresented in mental health issues, in substance abuse, uh, you know, in rates of suicide. And the statistic that gets me out of bed is the, uh, the bottom one there. 50% of transgender people uh, in their lifetime have tried to commit suicide. That's not just thought about it, that's actually attempted. Uh, thought about taking their life is, is over 80%. Uh, before transition and 4% uh, after transition. What's really important, I think, to emphasise here, it's not our sexuality and gender diversity that is the, the cause of our mental health issues. It's the discrimination that we experience that is the cause of, um, of those sort of statistics. So what have we got in Victoria? We have the first Minister for Equality. He's the Minister for many other useful things as well, Martin Foley, Minister for Housing and Mental Health and uh, the Arts. We have a portfolio in government, myself, and also a whole of government task force. Uh, we've had um, different health and welfare committees within government. The first one we had was back in uh, 2000. It sat in the um, Department of Human Services. It was actually attacked on the back of food and hygiene, and we met in the basement, but we thought we were Christmas. So we've come a long way. <laughs> we've come a really long way. So we've got a whole of government task force. It sits right there in Department of Premier and Cabinet. The Minister chairs it, which I think says an enormous amount, and it also means that the Deputy Secretaries don't delegate, which is kind of useful as well. A Justice Working Party, which is um, chaired, again, in a hybrid model between uh, a Member of Parliament and a community member, and also the um, Health and Human Services is chaired by the Parliamentary Secretary for Health, as well as a, a um, community doctor as well. And then I chair the uh, Intersex Reference Group. First time in Victoria we've ha ever had a, a, a group particularly focused on intersex where we have adults with intersex variation, parents of intersex children, as well as the medical prof profession working on those issues. Trans and gender diverse reference group. This is really important. We've secured an extra $6 million in Victoria in the last budget for adult transgender services. If you add that to the six million in the Royal Children's Hospital in the last government, and we now will not only be Australia's leading practitioners and uh, state, we're going to be knocking Amsterdam off in a couple of wow. years in being global world leaders in trans health, which I think is a fantastic legacy of this government. <laughs> so what, what do I do on a daily basis when I'm not talking to fabulous groups like yourself? I'm involved in all sorts of things. Um, you will have seen that this year we've, uh, we've just caught up with Western Australia and Tasmania, which is not anything much to brag about, but we do have um, same-sex um, adoption in, in Victoria. Unfortunately, uh, the minister was quite devastated. We still have religious exemption with that. Uh, my role was to work with the four adoptive agencies to make sure that no rainbow family is discriminated and there's a referral process. But unfortunately, it's still discrimination, uh, but we have same-sex adoption. Uh, we've amended the Relationships Act in Victoria as well. Uh, you may have heard a case in, uh, in South Australia. There was uh, two, two men who got married in England, where of course it's legal to get married in England, and they came to Adelaide for their honeymoon. Um, why they came to Adelaide <laughs> for their honeymoon, that's probably another PowerPoint. But anyway, they did. <laughs> the tragic story with that is that one of the men fell down a case of stairs and died and on his death certificate he was pronounced single. So you've got trauma impounded on trauma there. So of course the minister was straight on the phone, he says, Commissioner, Commissioner, what would happen in Victoria? And I said, 
exactly the same thing. So now in Victoria we recognise um, overseas relationships and that won't happen in Victoria. Later this year, I can't talk too much about this, but later this year we'll see um, hopefully some barriers in relation to birth certificates for transgender and intersex people, um, which was an election commitment, be removed and that's pretty exciting. And then with the rest of the, um, the, rest of the time, I was, yesterday I was announced on um, Minister Richardson's whole of government uh, steering committee on family violence. Family violence uh, in our relationships or our intimate partner relationships are tracking the same as heterosexual couples. So our relationships are just as mucked up as everybody else's. But our terminology around family violence is just perhaps a little bit broader. So it also includes parents who physically or emotionally attack their children when they come out or siblings that attack each other um, for coming out as homosexual or transgender and so on. Now, I sit on the Premier's ICE task force. We don't have a lot of data about lesbian, bisexual and queer women, but we know that uh, homosexual men in Victoria use illicit drugs 15% higher than heterosexual men. Uh, and I also sit on the um, Police Commissioner's Human Rights Advisory Group as well. I'm a big believer that if you're not at the table, you're not at the table. Even with people's uh, good intentions at mind, you need to actually be there for people to remember who you are and what you're doing. And then I also work in all the intersections where LGBT, LGBTI people are. So I'm working with uh, the Office of Aboriginal Affairs around brother boys and sister girls, which is the trans name, uh, transgender Aboriginal name for, um, for people in that community. I'm also um, working with um, the police commissioner. He's given me a bus to go around rural Victoria and we've identified the, uh, where the first slipper from Priscilla is. And um, <laughs> he said to me, um, he said to me, Ro, I'm not sure you can have it on the roof of the bus. Maybe you'll need to get a trailer, but anyway. Um, and, and Dolly Diamond, and we're all going to head off later this year. But it's really important that we make sure that all the work that we're doing in Victoria is, is in Victoria. And coming from Violet Town, that's really important to me. So multicultural and religious groups, this is, um, this is a, you know, a new frontier, I think, in this work. We've, uh, we've secured half a million dollars out of the multicultural money itself, and it's been run out of multicultural Victoria for multicultural LGBTI projects. You know, it was one of those horrifying things where, you know, you send out the invitations and you hope people are coming to your party. Like, I really worried that no multicultural groups would actually apply for the money to work with LGBTI people, but we've been oversubscribed, and so I'm really excited about that, and particularly overwhelmed by the applications from the Muslim community as well as the Jewish community. So we're gonna see some great projects coming forward. Uh, I'm also working um, with survivors of gay conversion therapy. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's the concept that religious groups have that you can pray away the gay. So um, I'm a survivor of gay conversion therapy, so that's worked. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, um, the organised groups, and, and we've inherited lovely things from America, that's come out of the States, um, like a groups like Exodus, they've been shut down. The two men that uh, were running Exodus fell in love, got married and apologised to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but all jokes aside, the, um, the network, I suppose, has now gone underground. And, you know, as late as just last month, I met with the survivors in a group in, in Melbourne, and this, this stuff's really real. Uh, and again, as I've said, it's only 10% legislation, 90% education. In Victoria, we're strengthening the powers of the Health Services Commissioner to be able to investigate some of this, if it is a practicing psychologist or you know, psychiatrist, which is rare. Most of it's in the Bible study, home, church groups, and it's really hard. We've got to keep the conversations going. Now, hands up, I'm going to get you to out yourselves now. Hands up all the data freaks. Come on, all the data nerds, put your hand up. Look, they're so reluctant. Oh, look, there's more data nerds. I've got to say, congratulations, there's more data nerds in this room than many of the rooms I speak to. Um, so congratulations on adding yourself there. Um, I'd rather stick knitting needles in my eyes, but I know how important data is, and we don't have, and you can tell from the presentation, we don't have a lot of data around LGBTI people, so, you know, there is... There is a move to do that, and I have collected all the data nerds in this space that I can think of that have been hounding me about this to make sure that we get some more information. We start collecting data, and even the computer systems that we have within the Victorian government are not set up to collect anything other than male and female. The new system that's going to come and be rolled out in the next um, year, or so, hopefully, will be able to do that. And so once we get the boxes and the forms right, we'll be well under our underway. 
And of course, as I've said, I'm working with local governments and we're producing a, a resource called Roads, Rates, Rubbish and Rainbows. So um, watch, um, watch that. The city of Bendigo, we've got, you've got a little bit to do. Um, just a little bit to do. Uh, just, a, just a little bit. So um, we'll, we'll keep going. So aged care, this is, um, this, is, this is an area that I'm also really passionate about because you know, many of our elders have expelled you know, enormous amounts of um, discrimination in their lifetime. Uh, and I, you know, I know stories where you know, people straighten up, as we call it. They put away their photos of themselves, their family, when home help come to clean their house or do some of those jobs. You know, they feel there's still that, that sense of shame. There's a picture of me in a digger. They didn't actually let me turn it on, which is a bit of a shame. I'm turning the sod for the very first LGBTI aged care centre out in Balan. So um, that's really, yeah, really important. And again, in the other intersections is LGBTI people um, with disabilities. You, can't, you probably can't read the name of the presentation there, but um, Jared's doing a presentation called What We Really Do in Disabled Toilets. Um, <laughs> it was an absolute clangor. Uh, but it's about, it's about how do we provide space and place. And, and for the disability sector that I invited to this forum, they said, well, we don't even talk about sexuality, let alone homosexuality. You're blowing the lid off this stuff. And this is really, really, really important. Um, we've mentioned the footy. I, you know, life is about coming out all the time. I had to come out to the AFL that I'd never been to a football game before. <laughs> and uh, they said, you live in Melbourne, are you mad? I said, look, it's never been a place that I felt welcome. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was, a, I don't know. I just never felt like that was a safe place to be or anything that I was interested in. But we are having a game um, in this religion on August 13th. See you all at Eddie Head Stadium between St Kilda and the Swans. And, and they've received a lot of, a lot of um, negativity already around that. So it's going to be interesting how all that works out. I think it's leadership. I think, um, you know, this, this Andrews government, and Daniel himself, has been incredibly, um, incredibly supportive, which is fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, love Dan Andrews. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, the good books with him. His biggest Facebook hit was when he marched with me at Pride. It's like, <laughs> you know, so, it, it, so far all, all good. But, um, you know, this slide is important too, you know, a lot of places I go, people say, you know, we should be, we should be treating people equally. Well, we know people aren't equal. We know that, um, you know, we need to be working actively for minority groups, and that's really important. Um, I, had a, I had a man say to me today, you know, why, why are you bringing all this, you know, sexuality stuff into the workplace? Why, why is that really important? You know, the sexuality doesn't belong in the workplace. And I said to him, okay, do you have a picture of your family on your desk? He said, yes. I said, do you talk in the lounge room and, and coffee room about what you did on the weekend with your family? He said, yes. I said, do I need to keep talking? He said, yes. <laughs> he said, I didn't get it. But, you know, I, I challenge anybody to spend five minutes having a conversation about what you did on the weekend without using any pronouns. I won't make you do it now because I'm time limited, but I do for some groups and they do find it incredibly difficult. And if you're using that headspace to try and lie your whole life as a Supreme Court judge or as anybody in the workforce, that time and effort you could be spending on thinking about how you're going to line up your day, what outcomes you're going to get. Um, it's incredible what LGBTI people sort of, you know, have to do in the, in the workplace just to get by. Uh, that's a picture of me and Chris Eccles. Uh, if you're on Twitter, I'm sure you all are, because uh, you're such a hip group. Um, <laughs> I'm just learning how to use social media. So far, I haven't got myself in too much trouble. Um, Chris Eccles is the secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet where I work, and that's him at our Christmas event. I think it is about, it's about leadership in this space, and um, when there's people like that, we've, and, and people like Daniel Andrews, the minister, and others. We've come a long way. We still have a long way in Victoria. Um, Tim Wilson used to remind me that, um, you know, he said, you know, Victoria is a bubble. Victoria is not Queensland. Um, but I think, you know, we have to be the shining light in Victoria um, because, you know, some of the other states are so far behind us. So thank you. One of the things that is hardest to do as a teacher is to get students' heads around how novel, how distinctive certain aspects of their lives are because that's the life they've lived they don't know another one so I used to 
have to lecture about modernity, with this fancy word for what's modern, and I developed this graph, which was called Everything You Need to Know About the Modern World, and it had, uh, up, it had on the horizontal axis 14, 1200 AD, 1400 AD, 1800 AD, 2000 AD, and on the vertical it was everything. And the graph went from, I don't know when, naught, 1200, whatever, it went long, 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 and in 1800 went Because everything boomed with the Industrial Revolution, Democratic Revolution, population boom, government boom, people killed in wars boomed, everything went up. And listening to Rowena now, I thought, oh God, I haven't, I am not alive since 1800. I, my life, which is long compared to most of the people in the room, even added up, but still, it's not that long. <laughs> but in, I was alive, I have to tell you, when, not that feminism was invented in my life, but active political feminism, which had bureaucratic and, and public repercussions, was when I was already past teenager. It became a major thing, the feminist revolution of the 60s. <laughs> then. The notion of actually appropriating the word gay or the word pride for homosexuality, which was something which traditionally it was thought people were ashamed of or should be ashamed of, was more recent than that. And then what Rowena has just told us is, again, it seems to me, seconds ago. It's an extraordinary development. I don't know how to explain it sociologically, but it's something that would have to be explained. But it is an extraordinary thing to keep in mind how, how fast things have changed, and they've changed for all sorts of reasons. Among those reasons is the activity of people involved in these movements in public, in, in public persuasion. And Clementine Ford is a public persuader, as I understand. She describes herself as, and I'm quoting, a feminist killjoy to the stars, a notorious boner killer, work, work, bookworm, and bon vivant. So I knew bookworm and bon vivant, and I asked my daughters on Friday, well, what is a boner killer? And they told me, and <laughs> they knew. Uh, and I winced. Anyway, an angry feminist who twice weekly shares her man-hating screeds in the sulfuric depths of Fairfax's res resident <laughs> witch coven daily life. She regularly appears as a commentator on ABC Radio 774 and the drama and her book Fight Like a Girl is due out with Alan Unwin in 2016. I'm interested to hear. Please, <laughs> clever thing. I'm back in a minute. I should uh, just explain for um, everyone who doesn't know what a boner killer is that it came from a speech that George Bush Senior gave a few years ago to the automotive industry in, in uh, I don't know, Idaho or somewhere in somewhere in small town America, and. That for some reason at this automotive conference the topic of abortion came up because of course it would um, and and one so, uh, someone made a comment to him about the kinds of women that you see protesting abortion and all of the men in the room had a laugh about you know the, st the stereotypical idea of what the fa what the average feminist is, is supposed to look like because of course in the words of George Bush senior or I'm paraphrasing how could they get pregnant in the first place? Because essentially a man wouldn't be able to get it up for them. So from there, uh, a group of feminists in America coined the term boner killer to affectionately refer to feminists as being, you know, so outrageously offensive and horrifying to men that we couldn't possibly have any kind of relationships with them, which of course is one of the ongoing stereotypes about women. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much to Howard and to Rowena, who's just had to duck out quickly, for those incredibly edifying uh, presentations. I was especially moved by a lot of what Howard was saying about the constructions of power and how that's been really taken as opposed to gifted from on high. And it rem reminded me of a great tweet that I saw once. Um, the thing I love about Twitter so much is that women are really, really funny. We're so hilarious and the way that we respond to sexism, particularly now that we have these tools to be able to use humour and sarcasm and, and broadcast them to the world, is so satisfying to me. But this, um, this young man tweeted to a, a feminist online and he said, 
without using Google, name one thing that a woman has invented. And she, just quick as a snap, replied, you, unfortunately. <laughs> Which I thought was great. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, though, I am going to take a rather more cynical approach to change and, uh, and how quickly it's being achieved today, while recognising the extraordinary steps that we've taken, not only in the law, but also in terms of LGBTQIPAS rights. And I wanted to mention as well, I mean, you touched on it briefly, but um, as Martin pointed out, the concept of pride being associated with gay people in particular, uh, and I'm just, I'm just using that singular term now because it's obviously evolved so much over the last few years really, and which is such a great thing for discussion and for people's awareness about diversity and difference. But the concept of disability pride as well is really, really exploding now. And I have a lot of, um, there's no way to say this without saying, without sounding like you're saying some of my best friends are. <laughs> But I have a lot of disabled friends who have really embraced the idea of the social model of disability, which as opposed to being something where you preference per person first language, as in saying all the time people with disabilities or women with disabilities, they describe themselves as disabled people because they take the view that actually there's nothing wrong with them at all, that what truly disables them in this society is the lack of access and the lack of um, understanding around issues to do with disabilities and access and things like that. That, you know, it, it, the idea of words like wheelchair bound still being used when actually for a lot of people who are wheelchair users, their wheelchairs are something that liberates them from, from being stuck, literally. Um, so I love the fact that there's all of these pride movements that are now emerging and the fact that technology and the internet and the online space has enabled people to really embrace difference and diversity and, and become those change makers and become those leaders. Um, where I am a little bit cynical about it is that I think that we can have legislative change but the social change has to come at the same speed. And it is changing, but it, it sometimes changes very slowly. So it is true that people say things like, I'm not a racist, but now. But that's only because they understand it to be bad to be a racist. It's not necessarily true that their views on racism have changed. They just don't want anyone else to think that they're a racist. And sometimes I think, well, maybe it would have been Maybe it, would, it was better when people were just more honest about those things. But they were like, yeah, I am a racist and I'm damn proud of it. Um, I hope no one just filmed that little segment <laughs> and put that up online. But I want to talk about social law and social change in, in relation to one specific area, and that's to do with the legal system and sexual assault. So sorry, taking a little bit of a nosedive into a difficult topic area there. Um, but a few weeks ago, I was invited to speak to students at Melbourne University's Law School. And I always find it really, really terrifying to speak to anyone about the law. And, and even actually being invited to speak today about justice makes me a little bit scared because not only do I suffer as most women do from I imposter syndrome, but also I have no connection to the law or the legal system at all. And in most things, I just skim read stuff so that I can bullshit my way through it later. Um, which sometimes works when you're discussing legal things, but not really when lawyers are present. Um, in fact, the only experience that I really have of the law is of being a big fan of procedural dramas and reading Jodie Picoult books. Um, I used to think that I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in high school, but then I realised that I actually just wanted to play one on television. Um, and that made the sting of not getting the marks to get into law a little bit easier to bear, especially when I found out what torts were. <laughs> not a fancy cake. <laughs> um, but as it turned out, in the end, I became a feminist writer, which pays a lot less than the law does, and, uh, but does allow me to pursue uh, fa fancy cakes whenever I want. Um, one of the areas that I'm really passionate about as a feminist writer is the issue of sexual assault and rape culture in particular. And for people who haven't heard of rape culture, just a show of hands, has anyone not heard that term, rape culture? So there are a few. I mean, this is one of the, this is one of the areas where I think this social change is moving in the right direction because even though there are some people who haven't heard of these things and there are a lot of people who have heard of things like this who disagree with them, the terms are still becoming a lot more widely used. 
So rape culture refers to, it sounds a little bit um, threatening because obviously we would assume that we don't live in a culture that condones rape. And most normal people, most average people would say that they don't condone rape. But that's not exactly what rape culture is referring to. The term rape culture really defines a society and a culture that we live in which normalises ideas around sexual assault and normalises things like victim blaming and places the onus of rape prevention onto the wrong parties, namely women. Um, the way that I interpret it is that rape culture is a society which provides a long list of excuses and caveats for how and why these things occur. Not only doing so, um, not only doing that, but also creating a very shallow and minimal idea of what rape and sexual assault actually is. And for most people still, when they think about the threat of rape and sexual assault, even in the way that women are taught to prevent it from happening to them, like it's our responsibility, um, it's still limited to the idea of uh, the evil monster lurking in the shadowy alleyway, women walking around late at night and taking improper precautions for their safety, when actually the reality of sexual assault is very different to that, and the data supports that, and also women's anecdotal experience supports that, that most victims and survivors of sexual assault and rape are uh, assaulted by people who are known to them, whether or not that's acquaintances, whether or not that's their family members, whether or not it's their boyfriend, friend, etc., etc. And this is a, um, it's a tough point to bring up because it necessarily involves me referencing somebody who should not at all be associated with blame or this story at all. But one of the things that really mobilised, particularly in Victoria, discussions around rape culture and around sexual violence against women in particular was the rape and murder of Jill Maher. And for a lot of people that personified the worst ideas of, of what rape was and also solidified for them that this was the biggest threat. The man that you would meet on the street who would follow you down the side, the side street, drag you into an alleyway and rape and murder you. The fact that that happened over a neat week um, and grabbed the public consciousness in a way that allowed for it to be resolved quickly was also something that enabled the ability to have these discussions. Um, but the very, very sad thing as I saw it about that situation was that one of the consequences, for anyone who followed that story, Jill Murray had been out drinking with some colleagues from work. Um, not only was the fact that she'd been drinking alcohol raised in discussions after that uh, uh, in terms of what women should maybe not do if they didn't want these things to happen to them. Um, again, that is part of rape culture is to educate the wrong people about prevention and assume that modifying behaviour will stop something bad from happening. Of course, it doesn't stop something bad from happening. The best it might do is stop it from happening to you, but it just means it will happen to someone else. Um, and the thing about that situation was that a big, fa a big deal was made afterwards about how Jill Maher's male colleague had offered to walk her home afterwards, and she'd insisted, no, I'll be fine, which was, of course, her right to do. And and I believe actually the right thing for her to do because she'd walked that path many times before and she felt safe doing so. She felt like her experience had made her safe doing that and that was a rational, normal decision for her to be able to make. It was certainly one that she should have been entitled to make. Unfortunately, because of what happened that night, a lot of the response was around how she should have let him walk her home and that she had almost unknowingly walked into this situation by refusing the help of her natural-born protector. I mean, not only is this going to haunt that colleague for the rest of his life, I'm sure, because of that narrative, but this is where I, uh, this is where I was referencing it being an awkward thing to talk about because I would not want to impugn his reputation in any way. But for anyone who follows the discussion around sexual violence and for anyone who's an expert in that field, her colleague was more of a risk to her that night than a strange man on the street. Unfortunately, it is the men who are known to women who pose the biggest risk for them, and that's backed up by all the evidence that we have and all the data around reporting and around experiences. Um, so I, f I think that that's something really interesting that a lot of people miss when we're talking about the construction of sexual violence and the, and the idea of rape prevention, and in terms of how that fits into justice, that often the methods and tools that, once again, women are encouraged to adopt to ensure their protection have nothing to do with actually discussing 
the elephant in the room, and that's the people who are at most at, who pose the most risk to them. Um, my experience as a feminist writer is that when I discuss these topics, I'm often responded to with vitriol about how I hate men, about how I'm the one who paints all men as rapists, that this is my modus operandi, and in fact the modus operandi of all feminists is to demonise men. When in fact my message has always been that humans are better and bigger than this, and that we should be able to trust men, and we should be able to expect that they respect us, and that I, I don't believe that men in groups or even as individuals, will be so provoked by the sight of a girl in a short skirt that they'll be motivated to assault her. That is not what I believe of men. Funnily enough and ironically, that is what the narrative around rape culture believes of them, and that's the one that they uh, that is perpetuated, perpetuated around them. That when responses to sexual assault stories and crimes involve language like, well, what did she expect? Look at what she was wearing. How much was she drinking? Why was she talking to him? Why did she go into his house? Etc. Etc. That's all language that actually creates the idea that men at the root of it are rapists waiting for an opportunity. Now that's not something that I believe and that's not something that most feminists believe. That is something that culture believes, but it's something that culture and a rape culture in particular also uses to excuse sexual assault and to make it the onus and the responsibility of women to have to avoid. <coughs> Whilst, um, and this sort of leads a little bit into what Howard was talking about in terms of maintaining that power differential, whilst also retaining the right to never have it become an issue for men to solve or address amongst themselves. So in terms of justice, the highest power is the legal system. And I've been frequently critical of how sexual assault cases in particular are handled in a courtroom, from defence arguments offered to how, uh, from defence arguments offered, in fact, there was one last week um, where a defence barrister was in sentencing, uh, his client had been found guilty of sexually assaulting a passenger who'd been riding in his cab. She'd sat in the front seat. And the defence bar barrister used the argument in sentencing that the assault wouldn't have happened if she had listened to what her mother had told her and sat in the back. Um, now that happened in May 2016. It wasn't an argument that was successful and the, bar uh, the judge did, the magistrate, sorry, did immediately shut it down. But it, it was still an argument that was seen as plausible enough to present, that there was no part of the barrister's mind that thought that is not something that I should bring into a courtroom. And of course he's not the only one. That kind of argument is used frequently. Um, unfortunately, even in sentencing, the magistrate chose to emphasise the good character of the sexual, uh, the rapist, and how this was out of character for him, and that previously he'd never shown any signs of this kind of behaviour, and so that all needed to be taken into account when giving him a suspended sentence, um, because the suspended sentence would be enough of a deterrent for this kind of thing to never happen again. Because of course we've solved the issue of sexual assault and it never happens at all. Um, so I think that when, this is where the confluence of or the convergence of social law and judicial law is interesting to me because the way that people often speak about the judiciary and about the legal system is as if it's this infallible thing. That you, uh, you know, I have defence lawyers writing to me after I uh, criticise some of the things that they do. Um, I have defence lawyers writing to me and saying, well, you know, what else is supposed to be done? This is the legal system, this is how it is. You know, the judge wasn't able to sentence or hand down a sentence that was bigger than that or different to that because this is, this is the precedent, what, what do you expect? And I find that really interesting because it assumes that the law has been something that's been handed down from on high and that we've had no history at all of influencing it and that it certainly hasn't, as Howard outlined, been for the majority of its existence defined by and written by and um, enforced by people who come from a very narrow identity group and that is basically white male, white men with privilege and usually white heterosexual men with privilege. The fact that up until the 90s it was still legal in some places in Australia for a man to rape his wife shows how exactly fallible the legal system is, and how it's not perfect yet, despite the fact that it might have made leaps and bounds. Um, one of the, the cases that I point to is 
to mention the religion of AFL is the fact that um, in the last, well certainly since women have felt comfortable to bring rape charges against footballers, there's been more than 36 AFL footballers who've been uh, accused of, I hate that word accused, Oftentimes, women who bring charges against men who they say have sexually assaulted them are referred to as accusers, and I feel like that really places the onus on, or, or, or rather emphasises this idea that there's this whole slew of false reports out there, which certainly there are a lot of people who try to point to, despite the fact that false reports of sexual assault are pretty on par with false reports of any other crime at around 2-8%. to, two to 8%, um, But no one ever forces anyone to try and prove that a burglary happened. Um, so, with, with the AFL, more than 36 players have been accused of sexual assault. I haven't found a better word for it, I'm sorry. Um, and in that time, not a single one of them have ever been convicted of that sexual assault. Which I find really interesting because I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying that an allegation is automatically true. But I do think that we live in a culture which preference is male entitlement and we certainly live in a culture which characterizes women of a particular type as being somehow provokers or Jezebels or scarlet women who invite the kinds of things that happen to them and that's none of that is my language that's language that we can hear said around the topic of sexual assault and, and rape and violence that Dependent upon what she has done, she should have known what to expect when walking into that situation, which is something I think that we should be really conscious of and really disparaging of, that we have a, we have a language that not only discounts the violence that women experience, but that assumes that there is a base level of animalistic behaviour in men where they can't control themselves. And again, like I said, I don't believe that. I'm sure that most people in this room don't believe that. So why does the language continue to reflect and defend that? Um, we could see that a few years ago when Spider Everett talked about the grand final there was a, an incident where a woman went to police after Collingwood won the grand final, I think it was in 2012, and said that she'd been sexually assaulted by some of the players. And Spider Everett, a former AFL footballer, was out on Twitter the next day saying, you know, I'm just saying, I'm not saying that anything's, you know, that it's okay to do these things, but I'm just saying that when you go home to a man's house at 3 a.m., it's not for a cup of Milo. Sometimes it is. And I think that that should be fine. I mean, the, the relationships that people have between each other shouldn't extend to if you walk into someone's house that you should expect violence to happen to you. The fact that we still use that language to defend it is an example of how the social law has not caught up with the judiciary on this. Um, the only person who's ever come close to facing any kind of justice for what they've done was Stephen Milne who in 2004 uh, faced an allegation of sexual assault because a woman had come back to his house with, uh, it was either a house that he shared with his teammate Lee Montagna or they were both in the house and she had consensually had sex with Lee Montagna only to have Stephen Milne sneak into the room, into the dark room, pretend to be Lee and start having sex with her, which is sexual assault, which is an act of rape and she realised it was him and she went to the police. When police called on Stephen Milne to answer to that allegation, his words were, she's just one of those footy sluts that runs around looking for footballers to fuck. And 10 years later in late 2004, th those charges went away, by the way. And of course, in a lot of people's minds, the fact that they went away or the fact that they weren't easily able to be prosecuted meant that it didn't happen. Um, but 10 years later, those charges re-emerged and he pled guilty to the lesser charge of indecent assault. For that crime, he was given a $15,000 fine. In his sentencing, Judge Michael Burke made sure to mention that the act was out of character and noted how much distress the situation had caused Milne and his family over the last 10 years. He also called the act unplanned and spontaneous and said that there was no threatening or violent offending. Again, I think that that really speaks to how the judicial system has been constructed around a very particular viewpoint that has not been influenced properly by diversity and by the presence of female experience. Because if we accept that most, if we understand and accept 
the reality that most sexual assault and rape is perpetrated by men, which it is, more than 90% against women, and that it's done by men who are known to those women, it stands to reason that a lot of that would be banal and benign almost in the way that it's executed. It's not done by dragging women down alleyways. It's done most often by coercion or by threats of violence um, or even just by habit. And sometimes the idea that sexual assault has to be physically threatening or physically violent and leave physical scars in order for it to be considered real is actually not something that takes into account the reality of what sexual violence is. Um, I don't want to put the spotlight on anyone, but the fact that one in five women over the age of 15 will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime means that there are people in this room who've had it happen to them, and they know that reality too. Um, the idea as well that somehow sexual assault must always be planned and, and uh, carried out deliberately in order for it to indicate harm or purpose on the part of the perpetrator is also damaging because it's almost more worrying that it could be a spontaneous and unplanned thing. All violence is a choice, and the fact that you could spontaneously decide to rape someone is incredibly troubling. The fact that that could be used by a representative of the legal system to give a minimal sentence or a minimal fine to someone because they think that that indicates that it's somehow out of character for them is terrible, not to mention the characters that this idea of the character that's often referenced in the courtroom as being something that we can determine or we can know based on how we witness a public identity interacting with their teammates or their friends or their colleagues, almost all of whom will be male, how we can know that that means that a sexual assault is out of character for them is an assumption that is not doing anyone, least of all the women who cross paths with these people, any favours. Um, a similar situation happened in 2009 when Four Corners screened the program Code of Silence. I'll wrap it up very, very quickly. Um, which you can all go away and look at the transcript of that, but the Code of Silence was a report into the sexual bonding activities that was present across some of Australia's sporting codes. And I will be very quick with wrapping this up. Um, basically, they looked in great detail at an incident that happened in 2003 in New Zealand where the Cronulla Sharks... Um, were involved in a pack sex, what I would call assault, of a 19-year-old girl. The fact that no charges were laid after that um, doesn't mean that nothing happened. Uh, it means that it's difficult to prove. But the fact that so many people in society held on to the idea that no charges were laid as proof that nothing had happened is also really worrying to me. Because what it indicates is that if someone is enabled to believe that consent was initially given, it means, and that anything that follows that is fair play. It means that they think and they believe that sex is not an ongoing dialogue and interaction between two consenting people, but that something that can be taken and something that can be given and then, and then not refused. Um, it's also something that speaks to the differential of power between men and women and how women are expected once again to be the gatekeepers of sexuality and to prevent bad things from happening to them. Um, I did have a lot more to talk about. I didn't realise that I'd gone so over time. I'm so sorry, but maybe we can get to some of these things in the questions. But I guess just to summarise, I think that change is slow and plotting. It is happening. But it's it's tricky to point to the successes of change within the legal system or change even within the law if change amongst the people is not something that is moving as quickly. If you are still having people saying things like, I'm not sexist but, I'm not racist but, or we still have this really disgusting toxic underbelly of despite the great movements that Australia is making in terms of social justice, young boys telling girls online that they should be raped, they should be strung up, fucked like dogs, fucked like pigs, all things that have been said to me, and then turning around and defending these things as jokes, that if people get upset about it, it means that they don't have a sense of humour. I think those are things that we should all be very worried about. So justice for me is much more about a holistic approach from the community and actually breaking down a lot of the stereotypes around gender inequality in particular and moving forward from there. Thank you. God, I didn't follow any Thank of you very much. Right. One of the themes which has run through, we've now talked over 
three sessions about a variety of topics to do with justice. And, and one theme which has kept coming up in these different topics is this is not a technical legal discussion. It's not a discussion about this provision or that law or that institution. This, if it's to be serious, and these are serious matters, has to be a profound social transformation. And as we've heard just now, uh, that's not, it's far from complete. We have time, we have half an hour for questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, I um, had the privilege of uh, listening to Rosie Batty speak in the same auditorium earlier this week. And when she was talking about um, family violence, she made reference to power and control. And the question that I have is often in my personal experience as being a business owner and someone who um, lives um, my approach to life is it's the person who's best suited for the role as opposed to the gender assigned to the person um, considering a role. Um, it's often said that to empower women is to disempower men. So when we're talking about change amongst the people and social change, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that comment around if we want to empower women in the community, um, that that equals disempowering men and what your thoughts are on that. Who would like to start that off? <laughs> well, I take a very strong view against the idea that the empowerment of women will necessarily disempower men. What it will do is remove privilege from men and equality and the pursuit of equality, and this is something that everyone really needs to come to terms to because up to this point, it's been stepped around and tiptoed around and treated as if somehow men can retain the privilege and the access to power that they have whilst also allowing women and, and men of colour and disabled people and uh, gender, trans and gender diversity, et cetera, et cetera, to have that same level of power, it's impossible because there's a finite level of positions and th th there's a difference between privilege and power. Privileges are something that everyone should share equally. The idea that somehow we need to protect straight people from having gay people get married because that will diminish the privileges that straight people have is obviously ridiculous because that is a, 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 an ideological position that it's a, it's a never-ending well that people can draw power and privilege from. But the idea that somehow we could have equality in the government and not have certain men lose their position within that structure is silly because there's only a finite number of positions. I think that framing it as something where the empowerment and equality of women is translated as being something that disempowers men only replicates patriarchal ideas that men need to have a little bit more than everyone else, just almost, almost kind of considering it as their, their savings account. You know, we've got our everyday banking account and then we've got our little nest egg account and that, that just keeps us a little bit safe. It's a buffer zone. For me, I feel like why is it so threatening, the idea that women could possibly have power in the same level as men? And why is it so challenging to people, the idea that men might have to lose something? Men losing something so that they come down to the same level as everyone else is not the same as them being disempowered, and it's not the same as them being subjected to inequality. That's actually what equality looks like. Would you like to add to that? Oh, that's a pretty good answer. No. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> there was a lady at the back who got the bug. Yep. Um, so my question relates to Clementine Ford's discussion of... Can you move it um, a bit closer? We can't hear. Okay, so my question relates to Clementine Ford's discussion of um, societal norms um, needing to keep up with legal change. Um, one of the most fascinating things I learnt at law school was that when the um, maximum sentences for sexual assaults increased in Victoria. There was a big push for that. Um, the uh, rates of um, findings of guilt plummeted, mm. presumably because juries made up of men and women weren't willing to convict people if they thought that there was going to be a large term of imprisonment at the end. So I was interested to find out the panel's views on what we can do about keeping up um, societal change with legal change um, and what the practical challenges are for fem feminism going forward. Well, it, it's 
people who justify the jury system says that the juries do reflect societal change and that that is the mechanism by which the law addresses itself to societal change. I, I think you're fundamentally misunderstanding a bit of the criminal process. The criminal, a criminal trial is not a search for the truth. A criminal trial is a challenge to the Crown to prove the allegation it brings beyond reasonable doubt. So that it's, it's essential to understand that the criminal process is not one of weighing societal change at all. It's one of whether the jury are satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the Crown's allegations against the accused have been established. Societal change... Sorry, if I could, so, okay. if I could just respond, I don't think I am no, misunderstanding. No, I, I hadn't finished. Well, um, I, hadn't, I, I hadn't finished. I'm dealing with your misapprehensions. The other, uh, the other matter is that societal change is addressed through the Parliament whereby the electoral process, you have your members respond, you hope, to what the societal changes may be. And that's been the method most commonly adopted in Australia for bringing about what have been, as Roe has pointed out, have bringing about the societal changes which reflect the changing attitudes of the community. Can I, I just, I do want to respond because I don't think it's true that I am misunderstanding it. The issue is that when the maximum sentences went up, the rates of conviction went down. It's not just that after that time, surely, that suddenly the Crown wasn't making out its case quite as often. What I'm getting at is that there was a correlation between the rates <laughs> that people were willing to, the juries were willing to find people guilty at, at the time when the sentences were increased. That yes. I don't think it's a misapprehension. Yeah, yeah. Look, that, that, I understand the point now. Uh, if I can just address this. What is, has been happening is as the coppers improve their uh, investigation techniques, rates of uh, tapping the mat, as it's called, that is, people who plead guilty, has increased enormously, and there are fewer trials. Otherwise, our system would simply break down. So you don't really know uh, what the rates of commission are because you're not comparing like with like. You don't know what the um, uh, admission rate was prior to the change. Let me say this. There is some no truth in the notion that harsh penalties result in fewer convictions. And this has been the Australian experience. Our country was founded on a convict system which required transportation. It had been the experience in Britain at the time where there were 73 crimes subject to the death penalty that the juries wouldn't convict if they thought execution followed. So the Crown then dropped the charges it brought against the convicts to ensure that juries would transport them rather than hang them. Now that's hanging. What we found with other types of crime is that very seldom does the penalty process ref is, is very seldom reflected in commission rates. The murder rates in Australia have remained relatively constant whether we had the death penalty, whether we didn't have the death penalty, whether it was imposed or not imposed. The only crime that you can really measure over time is murder, and it never changed, no matter what the penalties were. Can, can, I, can I just, yeah. I, the way that I'm interpreting your question is that the, it feeds into what I understand to be people's, specifically when talking about sexual assault, people's general assumptions about blame and fault and, and repercussions. And that is that, um, you can't expect 
a legal system in which you're asking 12 members of the public who live in the culture and the society that we live in and are as influenced by the culture and society as anyone else, that being influenced by ideas of victim blaming and men just doing what men do and being provoked, etc., etc. You can't expect them to be able to make completely unemotional decisions about uh, sexual assault charges and crimes. And the, the, the higher the punishment for those things, the less likely they're going to be to send a promising young man off to have his life ruined. And that was reflected in the 2012 case in Steubenville in Ohio, when two high school boys were filmed uh, sexually assaulting and dragging an unconscious girl from party to party. and were later tried and convicted for that and sentenced to two years in juvenile hall. And you had it, the, the level of victim blaming around that and the, so, the social backlash against what was supposedly happening to these young boys extended to the fact that even CNN's reporting of it lamented the loss of promising futures for these young sports stars. That's what my interpretation of what you were saying was, that, that Unless you change society's attitudes around cause and effect and responsibility, it will be easy for them to either not convict if they think that someone who has just made one little mistake will otherwise be sentenced to you know, a huge term in prison. And that's really the problem, is that sexually violating another person, particularly when it's a straight man sexually violating a girl or a woman, is not perceived to the same level of... Uh, violence and violation as other crimes because it's repackaged as something that he was just led into that he didn't mean it, it was out of character, it was spontaneous, it was just one little mistake and let's not let it ruin his life. No, I'll take the next one, I promise. You take the next one. Okay. The next <laughs> one is for Alina, whoever it's from. Uh, the other day, a friend of mine posted a picture to Facebook of their newborn daughter, and uh, her daughter was wearing a romper covered in little pictures of cars. And the comment that went with it on Facebook was something like, wearing one of her brother's outfits because I haven't had the chance to buy anything girly yet. And um, I, it just reiterated to me how gendered our world really is from the moment someone enters the world. And, and even in the example that Howard gave earlier of the... Uh, uh, the reworking of the, um, the four-person selection, it's still men and women. Uh, there's still a binary presented there to, to those people. Uh, my question is, can, can we ever live in a world where gender, or at least those two binary terms, men and women, uh, don't exist? And what happens to our world when we remove those, those two terms? Is it a great equaliser? Yeah, it's my version of utopia, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, um, this is where I have to tell you that, that at one point in my life, we had 20 Barbies in my house. Um, Did my, you love them? Uh, no, they weren't mine. They were oh. my daughter's Barbies. Um, how Barbie snuck in um, to our house for our daughter, it just did. People bought her Barbies. Um, it was incredible. Uh, you know, my daughter has three parents, two mothers and a father. Um, her father is like an active uncle in her life. She's eight now. And, um, you know, I can remember having, and I was the tummy mummy, which was a whole another panel discussion. Um, there really is a small market for butch maternity wear out there, but... <laughs> yeah, that, that blows the gender thing. You know, I was... Sorry, but I was... Yeah, I'm, I'm not even answering your question. I was the only, you know, eight and a half month pregnant woman nobody stood up for on the tram because I thought it was a big gut of a bloke. <laughs> so, you know... You know, and, and my partner, my partner wanted, you know, she was hoping for a girl because she'd raised two boys in previous marriage. Um, Ian, her, her father, you know, took in bets. And I, you know, I was hoping for the one in 100,000, you know. Um, but, you know, she was born a girl. And, you know, I think we're a long way. You know, if the if Gender and Sexuality Commissioner raises a princess who is more girly and pink than you can possibly imagine, we are a long way from this. <laughs> You know, but, but it's coming. It's coming. And it's coming because the, the, the young 17, 16, 17 and 18 year olds that I work with are pushing this enormously. If you're not in that space, and I'm sure you, you may not be, but there are so many gender diverse young people coming up through, you know, it, it, it is going to be a generational thing and it's going to change the society. Mm. It's absolutely going to change society. And this is not, it's not a Victorian thing, it's a national thing, it's a global thing on the movement around um, 
just throwing away gender stereotypes, you know, just, it is coming. Well, that's good. I had two things. Firstly, a comment for Rowena. In 2014, the Bendigo um, Youth Parliament team actually put forward uh, changes, well, a bill to change the religious exemption from the um, Discrimination Act. And I was actually really, really happy that you um, are addressing that because it's something that just is really outdated. And, and um, this is more of just a general question. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion about gender, especially in the media and um, uh, I was just wondering, this is just for anyone, do you believe that there's enough expert opinion or um, people that are being portrayed in the media to know what they're talking about when it comes to gender and sexuality based issues? No, I don't think there is. And people really misunderstand um, gender and sexuality and the makeups of that. And, and you know, I, and that's okay. It's, it's, a narrative that we have to have for people to understand it. If you, you know, if you've grown up cisgender and heterosexual, um, in in my world anyway, of concept mm. of gender, um, they're not they're not things you understand. So we have to sort of break break the lid open and have more more conversations about it. And we're still, as trans people become um, more advocates for their own experience as well. You know, that education will continue. I think. Mm. I think it's a problem across the board with having, that's why diversity and representation is so important. Um, the, the world is structured right now to prioritise and give value to a very small group of people. And the hierarchy of power at the top is, is really limited. You know, you've got sunrise presenters, uh, an array of blonde white sunrise presenters talking about whether or not blackface is racist and not a single Aboriginal person has been invited on to discuss that, or with the recent discussion about, uh, you know, Daily Telegraph's beat up about um, the university that was teaching. It, it wasn't even the way that they represented it. They said that they were indoctrinating their students to believe that Captain Cook was it's my my university. Your university was it was an invader. It was ridiculous, and and then they had a discussion on. I mean, look, it's Sunrise, I know that, but Sunrise is, Sunrise is also watched by a lot of people, so it is kind of on the pulse of the mainstream, and there was just no thought at any point, maybe we should invite an Indigenous person on to discuss this issue. The assumption that somehow people who don't, don't have the experience of oppression can adequately t speak to what that oppression means, when usually it's interpreted as, oh, well, no, I don't think that that's oppression, is obviously hugely damaging. Oh, just a short one. Now, I've noticed that the more money you get away with in crime, it, in di direct proportion, your chances of being convicted diminish considerably. <laughs> Not a bad observation. <laughs> oh, yes. There are dreadful inequalities, isn't it? You know, the white collar crim who comes forward after having absconded with millions is treated the same way as the uh, social security fraudster uh, and gets the same sort of penalty. Yes, there are dreadful inequalities in penalties. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, but if I can make this observation, uh, you were quoting various penalties, but you weren't quoting the full judgment. No, that's true. And, and it's, it's one of the di very difficult things in the criminal pro I only did serious crime, you know, you had to murder somebody or, or um, import a lot of dope or uh, molest a flotilla of children before you got to me. Um, and most of the criminal matters occur in the county court and particularly in the magistrates' courts. But I can only tell you that it, it's a, a fearful process uh, where you weigh the pros and the cons mm. uh, of all the submissions that are put to you. So if the barrister argues a case that you had a bad childhood, or the particular crim had a bad childhood and his mother beat him and so on, you have to deal 
in sentencing with that proposition. Doesn't mean to say you accept it, but you have to give it some weight so that the submissions of both the Crown and the, and the uh, uh, defendant have to be assessed. Now, the press, of course, never carry the full, the full range of options. You know, I've, I've read criminal trials and I thought, I wonder which judge had that. It happened to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, do you think that, if I, if I might ask a question, yeah. what do you think about the, the rehabili like rehabilitation versus, um, you know, just retribution? Oh, you know, these are whole departments academic careers are built on this. Uh, but I mean, in like you've obviously oh, well, sentenced I, I, people. I think the notion of rehabilitation by imprisonment is self-contradictory, in my view. Uh, I can't see it as, a, uh, as fulfilling. And then, just as I have that view, I look at what happened to the Australian experience. Mm. You know, we were incarcerated out here and as I've said before, within a generation, the felons had become yeomen because of the other factors, you know, in Australia. It doesn't happen much with the criminal justice system. I think it's forlorn mm. uh, in relation to incarceration. I think there are other forms of penalties. Do you, you have know, an idea for an alternative? It, it's very difficult when you're dealing with pedophiles, for example, mm. because often that particular class of person is your, often, your average citizen who's on the East Malvern tram, who goes to church on a Sunday and com supports community aid abroad. Absolutely the, the classical middle class person who is doing horrific things. And I don't know how you deal with that other than keeping the community safe putting him away. Could, so it mm. depends on the crime. Can I just... I, I want to have one observation on this gentleman's remark. One uh, concept that was introduced last night, it's bandied about now, but it's a clever phrase, wicked problems. There, we're dealing in the world, and last night we were talking about global dislocation, refugees, climate change, etc. A range of problems which it's now fashionable to call wicked problems because we don't have any clue of how to solve them. But we have to deal with them because they... Now, there was a famous, perhaps the most cited article in what's called Sociology of Law, Why the Haves Come Out Ahead, uh, by an American sociologist and published in the 70s, at a time when lots of people were pushing, sorry about this, for access to community legal centres as being a, a, pro, a, a solution to the problem of injustice not being well treated and he pointed out that quite apart from goodwill bad will socio-economic status and so on a system benefits repeat players so insurance companies people who are using this and rich people people who are using the system again and again have inbuilt advantages over one shotters even when you take everything else away and there are a lot of other things which lead to those advantages too. This makes the problem a wicked one in every society in the world. Uh, there is a Polish proverb which I'll let you have. It's better to be rich and healthy than poor and sick. That's a wisdom from the East which you can hang on to, but it's often the case in many societies and it's one of the prevailing things. You can strip a lot of, there are lots of accretions to legal systems which favour the wealth because the wealth couldn't or agree favour uh, males, etc. But there are a lot of these wicked things built into systems which don't, which it's very hard to get away from. One last question here. Look, I'll try and wrap it up fairly quickly. Um, but you guys have really raised so many questions that I'd love to talk to you about. Rowie, I'm, I'm really thrilled when you indicated that uh, the issues of birth certificates for people with a transsexual background is going to be addressed. Uh, you may know that I made an attempt to, uh, to change the, the current Victorian law when I sued the Registrar of Births, Deaths and Marriages um, and unfortunately lost. Uh, it hurt losing uh, at the time, 
uh, especially because almost concurrently the uh, the McBain decision was handed down, um, which which used another argument uh, as to the uh, the correct discriminator, uh, and in my case the discriminator was changed from being uh, the comparison of a married woman with a single woman to being a married man or a married woman. And, uh, and it was on that basis that I lost. But the other thing that has stuck with me for the last 15, 16 years now was that one of the, the three bench, uh, after having listened to submissions by council uh, for, for quite some time, suddenly woke up, pointed at me um, and asked everybody in the court, why are we talking about a woman? We've got a man here. I'd been living as a female for quite a number of years. I was wearing a skirt, uh, a modest skirt, stockings, high heels um, and a jacket and I was carrying a handbag and I felt a little bit awkward when that was uh, said at the court. But the other issue that has always been in my mind too is the treatment of um, trans people by the correction system, right. uh, the, the difficulties that they face in jail. And I, and I urge you to, to follow up the, the current treatment of, uh, of people in jail, and it, and it particularly affects those who are born as a male but identify as female, because at the moment, the system seems to be, well, we've got to look after them. We know we've got a duty of care because we've been sued a few times. Uh, so we'll stick them down at Ararat. And the most secure place at Ararat is where they put the sex offenders. Mm. Uh, and it's a little bit like sending the honey to the bees. Mm. So I'd, I'd certainly love it if, uh, if you could institute the, the sorts of discussions that might lead to some change there. Yeah, quickly, I can tell you that it's, I didn't mention it because it was only a 20 minute gig, but under the Justice Legal Work, work Group, um, we've got corrections in our sites, um, and the Director of Corrections has been to a meeting, and we've got a report coming back. That's fantastic. Well, we've had a, a mix of <laughs> historical evolutionary optimism, a sense of how bracing and difficult many of these issues still are, but also, uh, uh, a real sense that people are working at the coalface, if that's the right metaphor, I don't know what the right term metaphor is, on them. And so with thanks for all three speakers, I'd like you to appreciate, sorry, I'd like you to express them. <laughs>